Today, we're very, very uh, excited to have a very special guest uh, for this event. Let me open up with uh, a brief uh, introduction about the session. Now, the pandemic is not just a health crisis, but an education crisis for students around the world. This is a long-term impact to generations to come. We have not fully analyzed the lost opportunity in learning during the COVID lockdown. When students cannot go to school for an extended period of time, it is not just a loss in cognitive learning, but compounded by the level of stress resulting in emotional, psychological impact to their well-being. And that is something that is so critical. And of course, this painful and difficult experience globally uh, is an impact to economic, social, physical, and mental stress in the last one and a half years. Our heart goes to those in hardship and we pray for good health and safety for the people of Indonesia as we hear about the news in uh, recent days. Today, we are extremely honored to welcome one of our distinguished Harvard Business School alumni for this Harvard Asia Conference. His Excellency Minister Nadine Makarim is the Indonesia Minister of Culture, Education, Research and Technology. Prior to the current position, he was a co-founder of Gojek. Salamat pagi, Minister Nadim. We met a long time ago, and today, fortuitously, we have a chance to meet again. And I hold you with the highest regard and felt that your leadership has been so inspiring. So I've been very much looking forward to today. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you for the kind words. It's an honor for me to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Great. Well, let's start with your perspective as the Minister of Culture, Education, Research and Technology regarding the challenges that you faced during COVID. One specific concern that was shared across the world during the worst points of the pandemic was the fear that students' education could suffer due to the lockdown that prevented in-person learning experience. With regards to classes, well, there was the dual concern that students in poor or rural communities with limited connectivity would miss out on the online online learning uh, classroom experience, but also the online experience is a poor substitute for being in person with a great teacher in class. Now, as the Minister of Education during these trying times, what are the greatest challenges to education for young people in Indonesia that you've seen and what is your ministry doing to address these concerns? Thank you, Leslie. Um, I think this is a, a, a a very complex question with a very complex answer. I think every minister of education around the world is uh, wrestling with the same problems with slightly different variations. Um, I think we, we've come to terms as, um, as an entire you know, global society that the distance learning or online learning um, overall is not a, such a great substitute for, for offline learning. Um, it's too, too fast for the adaptation process for teachers, too fast for parents, too fast for students, for it to, to, to have the same level of effectiveness. So there's definitely some form of loss of learning. How much of that loss of learning, I don't think we can tell until a couple of years out, maybe a few more years out. So, so the research will, will be able to tell where we're launching um, you know, we just transitioned from the kind of the high stakes testing, content-based testing to more like a PISA uh, numeracy and literacy test this is the first year we will do it. So that will give us some color, some uh, uh, knowledge about, about, you know, which uh, of the areas of Indonesia are really uh, significantly behind. So yes, there, there's, there will definitely be some loss of learning, not just in the disadvantaged areas. Uh, we think this is true across, but it will be more acute in the, in the disadvantaged areas. We have, you name it, we, we have it, the challenges. Um, we have challenges of access to internet. We have, even those that have access to internet have trouble in reliable connectivity when they're doing uh, Zoom uh, or any type of real-time uh, class interaction uh, over, over um, online. Um, we even have um, entire areas that have unreliable electricity connection, um, so that's a major issue. We have issues of teachers uh, that were uncomfortable using technology um, and had never used it before certain applications. Um, you know, 
Uh, we had challenges of, of students and teachers not adapted to this new process of learning and therefore just trying to do an offline class online and therefore kind of overwhelming students. Um, and then we've got the, the even bigger issues of student psychological safety really being threatened during this time. Um, they are stressed, they are lonely, uh, they are bored. Um, and, and this is, this is a, just a growing body of research not right now that I think we're just, you know, we're, we're just scratching the surface on what the impact of this is. Um, because that not only affects cognitive learning, uh, it also affects, uh, you know, psychological uh, health. Uh, in, in our students. And, 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 and I think that that is, that is a huge concern. So th there's a few things that we did, um, you know, among the limited options that, that, that we have. Um, one is we gave, uh, we, we heard a huge amount of uh, issues about being able to afford data during this time. So we launched one of the world's largest kind of free data programs for, for children so that their parents, some parents have three children. And, and they have, that became a massive cost bucket uh, for, for a lot of parents. So we supported them in that. For schools, we actually did some pretty dramatic uh, uh, liberalization of how schools can use their school budget um, in order to, some, some need it to, to prepare for face-to-face -face learning, some needed it to uh, buy laptops or tablets, uh, and some needed it uh, simply to, to, you know, maybe send some teachers out to the houses and to some students' houses to help the ones that are most um, uh, disadvantaged uh, and falling behind. There were so many different situations that we had to give a very flexible uh, uh, budget policy to, to each of the students. On top of that, we heard students complaining about there was too much curriculum uh, being crammed during in, the, in this totally new method. So we created a kind of an emergency curriculum, which is far more simple uh, uh, with reduced targets, reduced scope to really focus on numeracy, literacy and, and character development. Uh, on top of that, we released a bunch of digital platforms to support teachers transition into this, uh, a teacher education platform from teachers uh, to teachers that, that basically supported them in, in learning how to use technology um, across the nation. The participation for that program was massive, actually, the amount of teachers that uh, were forced or f also were motivated to learn more about how to use technology. So there's a, there's a, a bunch of different things. We also, there's a whole kind of economic budget uh, and, and package, rescue package that we supported. We supported teacher, uh, university students tuition. We supported teachers that were non-government paid teachers. We also had a, had a, had a fund for them. Um, uh, uh, so a lot of social welfare programs that, that was not just the, the education side, but also the education system as a sector, like any industry was hit just as badly. So we needed an economic kind of rescue package that, that we fought for and, 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 and distributed as well. Wow. That's a lot of challenges that you have to deal with. I've, I've heard quite a few of them from United States, but in Indonesia, these are uh, compounded in many ways. Um, so brilliant that you have thought through the different uh, measures to be flexible and adapt to changing times. Now, if we were to take a peek into the future, right, and look into the path forward post-COVID uh, era um, and discuss the role of digital technology, uh, as a technologist myself, I always love to hear what others would be thinking about how technology could be used in different contexts. And I read about your talk on Madarka Balaja, if I pronounce it correctly, on emancipated learning. I think that's a, a remarkable philosophy if we could share with our delegates what that means. So Merdeka Belajar, the, the most similar translation would be emancipated learning, emancipated learning. And what, what that means is it, it's, it's a philosophy that was actually coined by one of our founding fathers, uh, Ki Hajar Dewantara, who together with Sukarno, our, 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 our first president, um, kind of redefined the concept of, of the educational system as, as an empowering tool for the individual for, and for the nation. And emancipated learning, what, is, what does that mean, right? What does that mean? It means 
not only does it mean to free the mind of individuals in Indonesia and free their potential, it also means to free every level of the of the institutions of education in order to provide autonomy, which is a necessary requirement to innovate, uh, in order to provide um, flexibility um, and, and respect the diversity that we have in our country um, and respect the diversity that we have even within a single classroom. So emancipated learning, I'll give you some examples. What are we emancipating? So, for example, we're emancipating principals to decide on their own with transparent reporting how they want to allocate their funding. That's an example of emancipated learning. Uh, we want to give autonomy to teachers to decide how far, how fast and how slow they want to pursue the curriculum, depending on where their students' capabilities are to not rush everyone constantly uh, forward just because, oh, they've moved on to the next grade. It doesn't matter. Let's leave everyone behind who doesn't understand it yet. That's, that's kind of one of the principles. Uh, the, it's the autonomy of the child to, to have some sort of choice, some sort of choice, um, you know, uh, in, in high school, for example, in the courses that they like. Uh, and to give them more choice and more freedom once they uh, get to university. Um, it is the freedom or autonomy to access information uh, through a variety of sources and not just a single textbook, um, both digital and, and, and you know, it's the freedom that teachers and principals have from um, administrative uh, tasks that overwhelm their ability to focus on their real task, which are the students, student learning. Um, it is the, the kind of the freedom for teachers to access material about how to become a better teacher at their own time and how to learn uh, at their own pace, at their own time, uh, through online learning platforms uh, that, can, that can empower them. So in university, emancipated learning means the ability for students to have the right to spend two semesters uh, out of their eight semesters for undergraduates to, to go and, and, and learn outside of the campus um, through real world immersive projects. Or, um, so research, social projects, entrepreneurship projects, uh, internships and so on. So, so emancipated learning is a catch all phrase to kind of, it can mean unbundling higher education it could mean personalization and segmentation of every classroom. Uh, it can mean a, a digitalization of, of resource and activities. Uh, it, can, it can mean uh, autonomy for our schools to, to be able to decide their own destinies and their own specializations. Um, so it means all of those things. Uh, uh, what it doesn't mean is uniformity. What it doesn't mean is standardization. Uh, what it doesn't mean is high stakes testing for kids. Um, it, these are not the things that, that emancipated learning means. Um, those are the opposite and what we're trying to move away from. It really resonated with me. I think this is the kind of education that many young, curious minds needs to open up the minds of what's possible. Um, and, and I uh, also, because for me, I go through a lot of the education process through my tailored experience to learn and to absorb and ask a lot of questions. And I pivoted from arts to science because of my own curiosity to learn all these new dimensions and solve uh, problems. And as now as an engineer and, and continue to focus on that, I'm very curious about how um, technology uh, could be a potential way of making an impact in this kind of philosophy in particular, like, um, data, open data platform as an example, because this is an area I'm doing a lot of work to support the Ministry of Agriculture in Indonesia. So I'm very curious about your ministry and the use of data to um, support that philosophy. Yeah, I think, you know, we are, obviously also because of my background, uh, we have a, a pretty significant uh, technology team. 
uh, now working uh, uh, for the ministry. Um, and uh, we believe that the role of technology and data, um, which you know are, are inseparable, you, you, in order to have data, you, you need to have um, applications that actually can generate that data. So you need, you need to do feature production in order to have significant real-time data. So um, we, have, we have product designers, we have engineers, we have uh, uh, pretty world-class engineers, actually. We're very fortunate to have uh, people who are coming from X uh, unicorns and X uh, top uh, global technology companies who are working for us. And we're building a, a bunch of different things. We're essentially building, trying to build a super app for education right now. Um, we believe that the role of, of technology um, are, are a few things in education space. The one thing we don't believe is that it's going to replace teachers. That's, that's off the table. People used to say that before the pandemic. I think that debate is over now. Um, I'm not sure um, what the, the jury is still out for, for, for kind of the medical industry, but for the education sector, for sure. Um, I think that has disproved everything that we, you cannot, learning is so much more multidimensional than, than just having, you know, information portrayed in, in fun games and quizzes online. You know, it's, it's, it's much more complicated than that. So uh, where do we see technologies used? So the first is actually, uh, I would say, referring to your question, is how to actually get meaningful data um, so we've shifted to this national assessment, which is a non, non high stakes assessment that does not need any preparation by any party. Uh, and it focuses like PISA, it focuses on numeracy, literacy, and then a few kind of core values, uh, uh, questions and, 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 and learning process questions that we ask both teachers and students. So, so really it's, it's a snapshot. Uh, but the, the data that, that we gather from, from this uh, kind of online assessment that we go nationwide from elementary all the way to high school, um, you know, we, we sample nationwide. Every school gets this kind of scorecard and all this data is, is, is going to be on the cloud. Uh, uh, so accessible to all kinds of departments uh, in government and certain organizations and research organizations outside of the government to access this data and be able to, to analyze correlation, obviously sanitize versions of this data, right? We're not going to uh, give individual uh, uh, people's data, uh, but, but, but the, the aggregated data can be analyzed um, and, and, and researchers can, can analyze correlations, causative relationships, and, and, and so on. So we can have data scientists go through it, uh, and, and I think we won't know the benefits of having all this data available uh, and being able to see it over every year, kind of changing and developing, we'll be able to see the, 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 the track record, the history of this data movement moving. And I think that's gonna be really, really fascinating. And, and you know, creative ways of how to protect privacy of data, but also uh, be able to share that data uh, with, with uh, uh, research institutions, uh, universities that are doing research and education and with our own kind of government related entities, I think that's going to be extremely powerful and game changing um, having that. So we will know which schools need the most help from us and we will also know which schools um, can help us uh, by sharing what they're doing as a best practice. And I think that that's very, very powerful. Wow. Second, thing, I can't wait to hear that. Um, when is it launching? Well, the first uh, assessment is uh, somewhere towards the end of the year. We might be a little bit delayed because of the recent Delta variant, uh, but by the end of this year, we will complete our first round of the assessment, national assessment. So, uh, which is completely zero stakes assessment. Uh, there's no 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 one is uh, no teachers are getting bonuses or cuts based on it. No students' uh, futures are affected by it. Uh, we're absolutely scrapping that concept. The only high stakes one is the entry level to universities that uh, we don't have an alternative to that yet because there's only a few spots for universities. But outside of that, uh, there's, there's no more high stakes testing. And we don't believe, uh, we, we probably think that, that like even countries like the US struggled really hard 
uh, learning uh, that, that, that those kind of programs kind of backfired a lot. Uh, where you kind of link teacher pay with with student performance when that's not how it works. The correlative effect is is much more complex than that. So um, so that's the first thing uh, in terms of, of of data and and getting all of the output data from students and teachers to kind of be able to splice and dice that data and analyze. Uh, the second thing is to to we think it's technology is going to be so powerful to upgrade the teachers, primarily to upgrade the teachers. One, technology to enable the principal and teachers to, to dramatically cut and automate away things, administrative tasks that they don't actually need to be doing, that technology can do for them so they can focus on students. That's a huge impact. Uh, another huge impact is the ability for teachers to learn autonomously. Um, teachers that are motivated to get better can learn autonomously uh, through online learning classes, through online learning courses at their own pace, at their own time, uh, according to their interests and according to what's relevant for them at that moment and their classroom for that moment. So I think that's another powerful branch. Um, another one is assessments, uh, assessments on demand, right? Automated assessments where teachers can pick and choose assessments and have their children do it to inform them. So this is the more evidence-based kind of management in a classroom where teachers are curious about where their students are and what level. And therefore, with that assessment data, they're able to know which students are maybe one year, two year behind, which students are way ahead and, and be able to customize and segmentize and personalize um, the, the learning experience in the class. They might assign uh, individualized homework. Uh, to people. Uh, they might decide that the kids who are ready might, might start already doing the next year's program and kids that are falling behind, they can spend more time with them to, to catch them up. Uh, and so uh, automated and, and, and digital based assessments that help the teachers uh, 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 position where, where the students are, I think could be uh, game changing uh, uh, as well. Um, I think online purchasing and procurement for schools to enable to give them affordable, efficient, and access to the latest books, textbooks, and give them choice and picking. Like imagine having like an like an e-commerce for for schools, uh, whereby you could have a far greater menu of, of learning toolkits, books, uh, reading books, uh, and, and 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 games, educational games that 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 they could purchase. Uh, I think this is also a very important uh, equalizer for especially for regions that are more on the outside but i think those are those are some of the roles that technology can play uh and that we're really pushing uh in in the, in the indonesian system sorry for the long-winded answer oh. there's many more but we have limited wow. time how many, how many days do you have <laughs> <laughs> i would love to hear more about your story and maybe that should be a uh, a case study written uh, years later about how you transform that and other ministry could learn from how you're using data and technology in a way that is so impactful. Um, so I will stay tuned to uh, as you enroll more of these solutions out there. Um, well, I wanted to kind of pivot to the next point around your reflection um, and how when you transition from private sector to government, um, I learned that there are 3 million teachers in Indonesia and 60 million students. And that's very, very significant numbers and how you are driving innovation at scale. Um, and, and that you coming from an, an entrepreneur background and how you are looking at problem solving in that and with agile approach, does your young entrepreneur uh, background prepare you for this role in government? Uh, it's a great question. Um, I don't think you're ever truly prepared the first time you enter a government role. If you did not come from government, uh, there will always be a very, very pretty radical transition um, of experiences. Um, so it's very hard to prepare for the public sector if you haven't been in the public sector before. Uh, but I do believe that a lot of what I learned in the private sector it, it is not just important, it became 
I think, a huge part of how we decided to execute our programs. Um, the very fact that that when you're dealing with those kind of numbers, you know, millions of teachers and tens of millions of students, you don't have an option. If you're not using technology in any shape or form, how are you going to move the needle um, at all? Uh, it, it's just, it's impossible, right? At that level of scale, you, you have to have, honestly, you have to have an app. <laughs> like uh, there's, 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 there's really no other option, right? Doing this the, the old school way is just going to be prohibit pro prohibitively expensive um, uh, and the, the very hard to control outcomes, etc. So technology is a necessary requirement of the sheer scale of the problem. And so I think my knowledge of building technology products and rolling them out to millions of people uh, was, was, was extremely relevant experience. And I think a necessary experience to be able to do this job um, or, or it could, you know, I think with the lack of that experience, things, things could be a lot, a lot more uh, kind of um, challenging and, 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 and with the risk of boiling the ocean, right? So, so I think that one, my technology background definitely helped with me uh, in, in building uh, technology products specifically for education because we have no choice with those numbers. I think the second uh, great thing I learned was the ability to um, recruit and identify top talent, which is a survival requirement in the tech sector. Um, and being able to apply that lens uh, to identify the best uh, 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 government bureaucrats, the best government leaders in government, and by bringing in the best from the private sector and outside um, to combine it. We have a, one of the youngest new teams in, in the Ministry of Education now, a combination between very senior, uh, idealistic uh, bureaucrats and very young millennial um, uh, people from the private sector, talent from the private sector. So it's a very novel combination. Um, um, and and it's, I've, been, I've been extremely um, grateful to have such an amazing team. So that kind of uh, management style where you give a lot of autonomy and a lot of support to top talent, I learned that in the technology industry, how to do that. Uh, so, so that was very different. A lot of the people who have been in the ministry all their lives were commenting to me about how different my management style is. Uh, and a lot of them were, were, were very uh, actually encouraged by uh, not having so much of a top-down approach, uh, but a far more uh, um, open culture of discussion and debate. So that culture I, I learned from, from, being, from building te uh, technology companies, large technology companies. Um, so we have an extremely open culture of debate. Um, I, I routinely tell people that if you're not disagreeing with me, then I really have no use of you being in this meeting. Um, so if all you're doing is saying, yes, 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 then I, I really don't need you. So, so I, I need, I need insight. I need to challenge my opinions. Um, uh, otherwise what's the point, right? Uh, I'm just going to make all kinds of incorrect decisions. Um, so the third thing I learned from, from coming from the private sector is um, pace of execution. Um, you know, I have a very, very limited time. There's no way I can transform the education system even within a four or five year time period. This takes at least 10, 15 years to do. So the pace by which I can get to some irreversible change requires a very different way of working, a uh, very which, which, which you learn in the technology sector, you know, like agile processes. Um, MVP. You know, yes, hi, you, 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 you release and then iterate, right? Yeah. Um, you can, that can be not just a technology product, it can be any program. And so my ability and my comfort with taking risks, despite, you know, all the political issues that, that, may, that may cause um, is, is is definitely a helpful characteristic to get things done. It's painful because at the pace that we're working right now, there's a huge, always 
always a backlash. Um, you know, the more you try to change, the more backlash there is uh, in the system, especially with some a system that hasn't virtually hasn't changed for, you know, 30, 40 years. Um, you know, um, so, so uh, I, I, I do think that that risk taking um, propensity I learned in the technology sector and became very, very useful for me uh, in, 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 in the public sector. I fully agree with you because in US we have a group called 18F. It is about um, the civic tech uh, hacking approach to digital government approach. Um, it's it stemmed from the Silicon Valley style of doing um, digital government with a new mindset. So I think you're going to be the, in fact, if you're not already the coolest ministry in Indonesia that attracts a young talent. Um, so I, I fully love to see the whole the, the journey as you unfold with uh, the, the new culture that you're injecting in government. Um, so I, I kind of wanted, you, you, you alluded to that, dealing with critics and skeptics, uh, with change also means resistance as well, um, combined with the fact that you are, after all, the youngest ministers in Asia with such high profile capacity. I would assume that you get quite a few vocal critics um, I'd love to hear from you. How do you deal with that? Because it is not easy to deal with some of these um, resistance uh, changes hard for humans. So I wonder how you address these uh, challenges. Well, I think that having an incredibly unified and purpose-driven team mm -hmm. is the best kind of defense against that, right? Um, if, you're, if your team are aligned, they share a mission um, together and, 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 they and they protect each other and, and help each other, um, you know, whatever attacks are coming from outside is much easier to digest, is much easier to protect because you have a solid, you know, family within the ministry that, that knows and believes what it's doing. So that's the first thing I would say is how we manage it. The second thing is nothing will prepare you. I mean, I was already, you know, leading a very high profile company with like millions of jobs at stake and, but nothing will prepare you for, for a political, for a political appointed position uh, or government position of this scale. Um, so people in the private sector, you know, kind of beware uh, uh, I had, a, I had a tough job before, but I think this is a new level of toughness in terms of your, your, in education, your stakeholders are everyone. Everyone's a stakeholder and everyone's an expert. Everyone's been a student or everyone has a child that is I, in, in school. Okay. So you've got a million different opinions. A lot of them are not, um, are different and don't match. Um, and, and everyone feels very strongly about it. So uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hyper complex uh, uh, stakeholder management effort. Um, and on top of that, people don't generally, there will always be people that don't like change and there will always be people that do not like uh, a non-education sector-based leader uh, as young as me, um, to kind of take the reins, it's obviously going to ruffle some feathers um, in, in the academic space. But, you know, I, I come into that with open eyes. Uh, I came into this job realizing that this would be really tough. Um, but I think over, over time, if you don't back down, if you have the courage to kind of continue on despite the resistance, you will see that the, 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 the people who are trying to discredit you after a while run out of reasons. And you will see that the, the people who were kind of just skeptical of you uh, and what you're doing begin to believe that, oh, wait a minute, I think this team in, 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 uh, in the government are really genuinely and authentically trying to make change. Um, and, and that's contagious. That's contagious. Once people see the authenticity and how many, you know, the bold moves that we're making, not once, but multiple times, like 
removing a 20-year-old national test, high stakes test, within six months of our Basically transitioning to a more liberal arts education system with allowing every company and research history to become a mini university. These are dramatic, super radical changes um, that, that, that I think then earns you kind of respect. By the, by the greater uh, uh, public. And, and you use that and you, you build your group of, of supporters, your fan base, right? Fan base to your policies. Uh, and, and, and then they become, they become your kind of defenders. And I think that's when things begin to tip. Um, initially, it's just gonna be all rough. Um, it's, it's, it's hard. We're entering our, so we're closing on two years now. And so I, we think uh, we're, we're about to fight some new battles um, moving forward. Uh, but, you know, we have limited time and we have nothing to lose. So, you know, wish us luck. Of course, you have a strong fan base among the delegates in this conference. I, for one, am rooting for you because I do believe in, with your conviction, anything is possible. Um, and one thing that I have a personal uh, advocacy and a wish uh, I want to bring it up to your attention, speaking from um, the personal experience as a woman in technology who comes from a very humble beginning in Singapore and then eventually came to the United States as an immigrant. I firmly believe that a great education opened the mind to the world possibilities and ultimately opportunities for young girls in technology, especially. So I love to see if your um, ministry will also um, focus on the gender dimension and woman empowerment, especially for STEM education. Yeah, actually, um, we just recently launched uh, kind of a, a historic uh, regulation. Either, either we, we just sent it out or we're about to just send it out, released uh, a pretty historic uh, policy on sexual violence and harassment. Um, so, this has been something we've been working on for, for over a year. Um, and, and really, uh, it, it, it doesn't encompass everything about gender equality, but it is the darkest side of it, right? So without taking a position and a strong position on this in um, you know, sexual violence and harassment in universities and in schools, um, uh, we can't even begin talking about the, the entire gender equality problem, right? When you are not addressing the most dark sides of this problem, right? These are all interrelated. So, the, so we decided to go with that, the most extreme side first and, and, and kind of address it and take a strong position on that. And, and we think that, you know, gender equality in Indonesia is something that is much bigger than just numbers. Um, I, I myself, just full transparency, I have three daughters. So this is a huge uh, topic personally uh, for myself. Um, and my, my point before was just, just because we have pretty good representation of boys and girls in schools doesn't mean that the job is done. You know, sometimes the truth can be hidden behind that data. We can see during the pandemic that, you know, the, the people who are getting pulled out of schools because now a lot of parents think school is a waste of time because it's only online, right? Um, are usually women, right? It's usually girls. Um, that that's that's a, has a much higher proportion that have been taken to take care of their little siblings or to help mom at work um, uh, uh, and so on. So so um, we we are going to. I think women and and girls, especially during the pandemic, are bearing an, a disproportionate burden here on, on, on the effects of the pandemic on, on, on their future. So we have to really monitor and see what happens there. Right now we are instituting institutions within each university whose job will be to monitor uh, these issues of, of gender uh, uh, discrimination, violence, and so on that, that will be also participated by students for students as well and by, by professors as well. And we're kind of mandating this institutionalization, very similar to in the US of what's happening, to, to kind of take a very strong stand. Um, there were three, we call them the three cardinal sins 
uh, in our education systems. One is intolerance. The other one is uh, sexual violence uh, uh, and discrimination. And third is, um, uh, third is bullying. These are kind of the three cardinal sins that we've taken a strong position on saying, and these are the things that we have to try to root out in our education system um, in, in a very uh, visible uh, uh, way. Um, so I think, you know, outside of that, this is a complex subject that will require deeper research. We're working with organizations like UNICEF um, and, and World Bank to actually structurally break down all kinds of these gender inequalities and see what role the government can play to kind of pushing it on the right side of history. That's wonderful. I'm so happy to hear that you are putting so much emphasis on this and your vision to address gender dimension will improve the girls and women in Indonesia, especially from the education, but also their uh, workforce, uh, labor force participation in future. So I'm very optimistic about that. Um, well, really almost up on time. And um, I'm, I'm just so thankful to you that uh, your energy and your optimism is very contagious. And I also share your belief that education is the most effective and the best form of public investment in the youth to address inequality and give everyone a fair opportunity to reach the highest potential. And I'm also encouraged to hear from you today about how technology as an enabler to achieve the full human potential uh, in, in whatever they want to achieve in future, especially from the way they learn and the giving them the, all the different tools and adapt to this. So thank you so much today for your time and um, your great uh, vision with the audience and many of the students here and the young leaders are going to be your fan club after listening to you. We wish you all the best and may the force be with you. Terima kasih and selamat tinggal. Thank you so much, Leslie. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me on this uh, uh, webinar.